Hello everyone. If you're here for a free webinar on critical pump selection, then you've dialed in successfully and hopefully you've managed to log in without difficulty. Today's webinar presentation will be 20 minutes, followed by question and answer. One question that has already come up is, am I going to be making today's PowerPoint presentation available? No, however, there will be follow-up blog postings on the Equestral website in the coming weeks covering these issues. My name is Randall Furman. I've been involved in the pump business for over 35 years. I spent 33 years with FlowServe Pump Division and its predecessor companies, including BWIP and Byron Jackson. The last several years, I've been doing independent engineering consulting, specializing in industrial centrifugal pumps. Today's webinar presentation is Critical Pump Selection, Three Major Issues. Critical here implies pumps that are critical to the operation of a process or plant. Usually there is some degree of engineering specification involved in their procurement and it is not off-the-shelf equipment. The scope of this webinar is rotodynamic pumps, the modern terminology for the category of pumps that develop pressure or head by kinetic or velocity means. These are impeller pumps for liquids. Excluded from today's presentation are the solids handling pumps, highly viscous applications, and a few other special pump types. The three major issues we're going to address are number one, matching the pump to the system, number two, resolving NPSH and the impeller inlet, and unanticipated or unforeseen problems. In looking at a generalized pump selection process, the first thing that is looked at is, of course, the conditions of service. And those would include hydraulic related items, the total head, flow, NPSH, liquid properties, and mechanical design related items, pressure, temperature, the operating environment, and any special material requirements. And industry and application specifications play an important role. Uh, these are just a few examples of the many uh, industry specific type of specifications, API 610 for the hydrocarbon industries, uh, ASME B73.1 for the chemical process industry, uh, and so on. Client specifications play an important role, whether the client wants a horizontal or vertical orientation, particular pump type, driver type, bearing arrangement, type of first stage impeller, nozzle orientation, and any non-destructive examination. Once the conditions of service are established, the first choice would be an existing pump design that can meet all of the performance requirements. Specified industrial pumps, even when they are existing designs, may have some modifications or special materials of construction and are often manufactured to order. If there is no existing pump design that meets the conditions of service, then the process of finding one starts with selecting the pump speed. So how do you choose the pump speed? The highest practical speed will result in the smallest pump size and most economical selection. Issues related to the selected speed are suction specific speed, driver speeds available, specific speed, and any velocity or head limitations. Suction specific speed is the relationship of speed, flow, and NPSH variables. The highest possible pump rotational speed is ultimately limited by suction performance, and suction specific speed is the key index of centrifugal pump suction performance. Electric motors can be either fixed or variable speed, and there are other pump driver options, and any of the various driver types might be equipped with a gearbox or variable speed coupling.
Speed selection translates to specific speed for a given head and flow and influences the impeller geometry and attainable pump efficiency. We're going to take a closer look at major issue number one, matching the pump to the system. The conditions of service necessarily began with an estimate of the system head versus flow or system curve. System curves will always have a variable head component and many of them, but not all of them, will have a static head component as well. A pump will only operate on the system characteristic curve. Here we have the pump curve and here's the system curve and this is where the pump will operate. Now in this particular case the pump peak efficiency is to the right at a higher flow relative to where the pump is operating so this pump is slightly oversized. The problem with an oversized pump is it will operate at reduced flows where various undesirable phenomena may occur. For example here we have the best efficiency point area and as we reduce flow we get into suction recirculation, discharge recirculation, cavitation issues infecting the impeller life, increased vibration affecting the bearing and seal life, and as we reduce uh, even further instability and temperature rise issues can happen. With a fixed speed pump, when the system demand is reduced, the pump must be throttled. This results in a new system curve and the pump is now operating further away from its peak efficiency. Also, the pump throttling results in a difference in head between where the pump is operating and what the system or the process demands. So that translates into wasted energy. The benefit of variable speed operation compared to throttling is that the wasted energy of head reduction is avoided. Plus, the pump operates at a more favorable rate of flow relative to the pump peak efficiency. Instead of just throttling away head, we're reducing the pump speed to a new operating point on the system curve and avoiding the wasted head and other undesirable flow dependent phenomena. How do we minimize oversizing of a pump? Be cognizant of margins on top of margins. For instance, if margins are already added to the friction factors, then is it necessary to then add margin to the pump? Where uncertainties exist, vary parameters and determine the range of outcomes. Most often, the static portion of the system head is well established. Separate out the static portion and apply margin only to the variable portion of head. Finally, use a variable speed drive to accommodate system uncertainties. We've talked about how the system curve affects the sizing of the pump, but suction performance of the first stage is a very important issue. Major issue number two, resolution of NPSH and the impeller inlet is actually a package of related issues including NPSH available, flow incidence, NPSH margin, and cavitation. Taking a look at the pump and system curves, there's usually a so-called runout condition based on variations in the system characteristic. So we have the design head curve here and a minimum head system curve and the intersection of that with the pump system or pump curve is the runout condition. One of those variations comes about for instance in a multiple pump system when one or more pumps are not operating and that reduces the system head. This causes the remaining operating pump or pumps to run at a higher rate of flow on its respective curve. 
The minimum system curve can also occur when, for instance, the static head is reduced. There's also an NPSH available system curve, which must be equal to or higher than the pump NPSH required curve. Or putting this another way, the pump first stage impeller must be selected or designed to accommodate the specified NPSH available at runout. It is often the case that the runout condition affects the first stage impeller selection or design. So here, this is the runout flow. This is our NPSH required curve, and it intersects at the NPSH available curve. And in this case, we have just enough NPSH to operate out at that runout flow point. I'm going to introduce a couple additional performance related issues which are often behind the scenes as far as the specifying engineer is concerned. Uh, these issues are well known to the pump manufacturers hydraulic design engineers. One of these is flow incidence. Incidence is the angle between the impeller vane and the flow relative to it. I'm showing an arrow here of flow coming at the vane and any variation of angle of that flow relative to the vane uh, is incidence. It's desirable for cavitation erosion purposes to keep the incidence angle to a minimum for the normal pump operating condition. Another very important issue is the onset of suction recirculation, which normally occurs at a reduced flow lower than the pump BEP flow. Here's the flow for the onset of pump suction recirculation. There's the BEP. Higher vibration and cavitation intensity occur at and below this flow. There's another flow, usually close to the pump best efficiency flow, known as zero flow incidence or shockless entry. This is where cavitation is a minimum as indicated by the curve of NPSH for cavitation inception. The zero incidence flow and onset of suction recirculation are important reasons why it is desirable to operate the pump in the range of the best efficiency point flow. Some explanation of NPSH margin. It can be either an absolute value or a ratio, ratio of NPSH available over NPSH required. NPSH margin ratio is in the range of 1.05 to 1.5 are typical. Uh, NPSH margin ratios greater than 1.5 may be required for impeller eye velocities that are quite elevated, such as found in boiler feed pumps, water injection pumps, and other high head pump types. Incidentally, the Hydraulic Institute is close to releasing a new NPSH margin guideline. NPSH margin often exists at the design flow. Here we have the design flow, the NPSH available, the NPSH required, and at the runout condition flow, we're showing no margin. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that we have no margin, but there is a potential adverse effect of adding extra margin, being overly conservative on the NPSH margin, particularly at the runout flow condition. And I'll illustrate what's going on in the next slide. So here we have margin of flow added to the runout condition and the NPSH required curve was pushed out. This was done by impeller modification or geometry modification of the veins and what it does is it pushes out the NPSH inception curve so the point of zero flow incidence is moved away from the operating point 
the onset of suction recirculation is moved towards the operating point. So this is basically a design compromise in order to satisfy the NPSH required at the runout condition and its margin. Added NPSH margin at the runout flow condition can lead to increased impeller inlet tip velocity. Cavitation erosion intensity is closely related to this I tip peripheral velocity. Material selection for cavitation erosion resistance is important. Some applications with elevated tip velocities rely on a combination of design and materials to provide satisfactory impeller cavitation erosion life. Major issue number three, unanticipated or unforeseen problems. These are the general areas where problems can occur, and these can affect either delivery or satisfactory installed performance. An important question is, does the manufacturer have experience with main parameters such as head, head per stage, flow, input power, pressure, temperature, etc. for the selected pump? And does the manufacturer have experience with the specific design features of the specific model and size of the pump selected? New or existing designs can be subject to unanticipated or unforeseen problems when there are any unproven changes, design differences, or modifications on a given product. An example of an unproven change could be a different speed, or a different stage count, or use of a new foundry or pattern for the given pump, or change of location for the manufacture of the pump. Returning to the pump performance selection process, when the speed is selected and after checking the first stage performance, the stage count is resolved. There's actually a whole iterative process that sort of happens all together involving the speed selection, determining the first stage performance, and resolving the stage count. All right, to recap here, we have the three major issues, matching the pump to the system in order to avoid oversizing the pump, resolving the NPSH and impeller inlet, and it's, that's sort of an oversizing problem also. If we provide or allow too much margin, especially for the runout flow, then we oversize the impeller I. And then there's the unanticipated and unforeseen problems. Now I'm going to take some questions from the attendees. Before you leave today, I'd appreciate your feedback. Visit equestral.com slash feedback to post any comment and give your opinion about the presentation. I would also like to hear your suggestions for topics of future webinars. Let's take up the first question. Here's the first question from one of the attendees. Is it wise when uncertainty exists to utilize a variable speed drive to evaluate system performance? Well, system performance can be evaluated with or without the variable speed drive. It could be evaluated with a fixed speed drive. In any event, it is a good idea to evaluate the system performance. Here's the next question from another attendee. I'm going to attempt to paraphrase the question here. If you're trying to achieve a minimum design head and flow, anticipating that the system head may increase over time, is there a limit on design minimum flow with respect to the pump BEP? It's not an absolute. The preferred lower limit of continuous operation would be around 75 or 80 percent of BEP, but the allowable lower limit of flow varies widely. Uh, this information might be indicated on the manufacturer performance curve. Now 
That concludes our questions. Thank you for attending this webinar. I would like to know, what did you think of this webinar? I'd like to hear from you. What topics interest you for future presentations? Visit equestral.com slash feedback to post your comments and give your opinion about the presentation. Thank you again. Visit equestral.com to subscribe by email and receive notifications of our future webinars.